before I start talking about how to create a culture of experimentation, I'm actually going to have all of us participate in an experiment. Here's how it's going to work. We're going to see how quickly a group of this size, roughly 400 people, can self-organize. More specifically, we're going to see how quickly you can go from random clapping, as in applause, to synchronized clapping in unison. OK, make sense? A couple of ground rules. No one is allowed to stand up and take the lead, right? It's about self-organization. Secondly, you will not go longer than three minutes, because I will cut you off after three minutes or 180 seconds. And finally, if you've done this before, don't tell your neighbor about it, OK? Don't tip anybody off. So with that, I want you to come up with a prediction. What do you think? How long is it going to take for this group to self-organize in this manner? Now, because we're scientists, I'm going to actually ask you to write that number down on a piece of paper. Now, let's do a show of hands. I heard a couple of people saying 12 seconds. How many of you think 12 seconds or more? How many of you think 10 seconds or more? Or more. You can keep your hands raised if they were before. OK, it's about half. So again, when I say start, start clapping. When I put my hands up, that means try to clap in unison. At that point, I will turn on my timer. All right, let's start clapping. Good job. <laughs> so that was three seconds. Yeah. This is how difficult it is to predict an individual's behavior, much less a group's behavior. And all of you are very smart individuals. It was through realizations of this, and frankly within our products, that led me and the leadership at Intuit to realize that our, the way we were making decisions before wasn't good enough, and that we needed to change to be a culture of rapid experimentation. Another way to look at this is how do you go from traditional thinking, right, where there is one right answer. And often you spend time in a room discussing or debating that answer. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of PowerPoint. Often the hippo makes the final call. The hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. Okay. <laughs> I've been there. Shifting that to a culture of experimentation, where there are many right answers. With so many different possible right answers, it behooves everyone. It behooves those teams to come up with potentially varied solutions and then rapidly experiment and have the customer decide through their behaviors what works and what doesn't. All right, this is part of our Design for Delight initiative, which Scott Cook, our founder, and I began to spearhead back in 2007. Uh, we talk about deep customer empathy, right? those follow me homes and going broad to go narrow. This is how we get our inspiration for our ideas. And we use rapid experimentation, blown out here on the left, the rapid experimentation loop, to make those calls. All right. Again, this is the traditional way of working, at least in software. We observe, we have an idea, we analyze and present and present and present and get shared vision and have side conversations in the hallways to build support, more of that politics, more of that PowerPoint. Finally, decisions made, we design, build, launch, and market, and we send it to our users. Now, the costs of this go much larger as you go further down the y-axis, or the x-axis, sorry. So at Intuit, now we've shifted it. We bring the users up before we make the decision to actually build it out. You can see the cycle is much shorter, and as a result, our costs are much lower. So let me give you some more information. This chart shows some of our business results. You can see in the old way a couple of things. First of all, these, label, these axes are deliberately not labeled. But I will tell you, we are willing to spend millions and tens of millions of ideas, of dollars going after an idea. Those were all failures, in case you couldn't tell by the small green bars. On the right are projects that we ran through rapid experimentation. Here you can see the costs are much lower, because we're eliminating that large design and build piece of the process. And the numbers are much more successful. I will tell you that our hit rate from the left side, the old way, to the new way is not necessarily significantly different. But because it is so much cheaper and faster, we can run 50 different ideas through the machine on the right in the time and resources it takes to run three ideas in the machine on the left. Does that make sense? 
All right, so let me tell you about a specific story to make it a little bit more real to you. This is the story about Fasal. There's a team in India that has unstructured time. Actually, all of our employees at Intuit have unstructured time. You have 10% of your time to do what you'd like, to solve something of interest to you. At the time, there was a lot of press in India about farmers and the large number of su suicides in that population. The team thought, well, this is a pretty big pain point if people are killing themselves, and I wonder if there's something that we might do. Let's use our unstructured time to find out. So the team went out and did what we always do. They spent a lot of time with these rural farmers. The woman in the upper left-hand corner is Deepa Bachu. She is a design leader, and she also played the role of product management. She was accompanied by two engineers. They spent about two weeks with rural farmers in India. They were from our Bangalore office. And what they learned were a number of surprising uh, facts, surprising to them at least. When you're in rural India, you often only have the choice of going to one of two marketplaces to sell your goods. It's because the roads are frankly not particularly well built, and the distances can be quite large. Once you choose which market to go to, you look for a Mondi agent. These Mondi agents are in the marketplace, shown over here. Those Mondi agents let you know what price they'll be willing to pay for your goods. These Mondi agents have no sense of transparency. And in fact, you'll literally see them with a cloth over their hand as they indicate to the farmer what they're willing to pay him for his goods. Now, if the farmer doesn't like that price, he can go home. The problem is, in particular for farmers of perishable goods, they don't have refrigeration. So by the time you get your tomatoes home, frankly, you don't have a lot of other options, which is why a large proportion of these farmers sell their goods for far less than they could make. Definitely a profound problem. So the team came up with a number of ideas for how might they solve this. They first created a vision. And their vision was, how can we raise the farmer's income by 10%? What's important about this is it doesn't contain a solution in it. There are many ways that you might do this, and the team came up with several. One idea they looked at was could we create some type of an eBay-like marketplace where buyers indicate what they've got to sell, or buyers indicate what they'd like to buy, sellers indicate what they've got to sell, and then we could do the matchmaking. It would be a very transparent manner, and the buyers could get the best price, and the sellers could get the best goods, et cetera, or vice versa. Um, so what happened is they went out with some mock-ups, and they shared this with the various Mondi agents and also with the farmers. The farmers were all over it, but the Mondi agents were unwilling to buy produce they hadn't inspected themselves. So the team tossed that idea and moved on to the next one. The next idea they had involved helping farmers to grow the crops that were more likely to get a higher price. So the notion is, if I know that I am growing potatoes and everybody else around me is growing potatoes, those prices might be lower. So I might decide to instead grow chilies. Right? Once they tried this, what they realized is the farmers really weren't certain to do with the information that 100 of their neighbors were also growing potatoes. And frankly, we at Intuit were not able to effectively predict what the export market or other markets might be like. The team, again, quickly abandoned that idea until they came to the third idea which ended up involving SMS texting prices to farmers at various markets. So let's walk through the experiment loop. The vision is 10% higher prices for farmers. The idea is using SMS text messaging to let farmers, virtually all of whom have a fun phone, uh, understand what the various prices are. There are a lot of leaps of faith here, a lot of big assumptions. Can illiterate farmers read SMS texts? I don't know. Right? The team didn't know for sure. Are the Mondi agents going to be willing to give the prices out that they're willing to pay? Will they actually honor the prices once the farmers arrive at the market? There were many assumptions to be tested. So the team ran an experiment. They found 50 farmers who were interested in participating. And they found five Mondi agents who were interested in participating. And they narrowed their sample considerably to farmers of perishable goods. What happened is two of the people on the team went into the markets to understand what the prices were. One guy in the back office sat there and he spent his days SMS texting 50 farmers at the prices of produce at various markets. They did this for six weeks. And at the end of those six weeks, they had some good learnings. Here's what they found. They found they got the farmers about 20% higher prices on average. And that continued to be their finding as they used rapid experimentation to, ex to explore other aspects of their business model. 
Today, it's actually used by over a million farmers. The team feels great about it. Um, and our operating costs have gone down significantly as we've increased the number who are using the product. All right, so why do we experiment at Intuit? It's great for our employees. I guarantee you that the computer science engineer who was in the back room SMS texting those farmers, he's never been more engaged, even though that is certainly not what he went to school to do. Happier customers, and you get those happier customers faster and better business results, as I shared earlier. So at Intuit, we have doubled down on rapid experiments in the last few years. We've gone from literally a handful back in 2008 and even in 2009 to a rapid acceleration, where in the last six months of 2012, we've run over 1,300 experiments. Now importantly, those experiments are being run in all areas. It's not just product. It's not just marketing. IT ran an experiment. It turned out that to get engineers hosting, their hosting environments, it was taking several days, sometimes weeks, which is insane, because that means that's time that new engineer is not being productive. The IT group pulled together all of the various disciplines that are responsible for hosting, whether it was security um, or various types of engineering operations. They sat one individual from each group in a room together, and they figured out how to get individuals set up in a matter of hours. Once they nailed how to do that, now it's being scaled across the organization. This mindset is pervasive. Another great example comes from our order management group. The order management group realized that some of our subscribers for QuickBooks Online were losing their subscription because their credit cards had expired. They decided to try calling people a couple months before their credit card expired with a warm, friendly phone call. Turns out the customers were grateful to hear from them, and that added an additional $1 million in revenue. Simple, lightweight experiment. All the team needed to do to try that out was call 10 customers. You can do that in two hours. We've actually changed into it from being an 8,000 person company to be an 8, 000, a team of 8,000 innovators and entrepreneurs. We are a small group of startups or a large group of small startups within the company. We talk about two pizza teams. The best team size is four or five. If you need more than two pizzas to feed that team, it is far too big. And I will tell you that, remember that chart, the bar chart of the amount of money we spent, right, versus the number of customers? Those big projects that had the large amount of money spent, all those teams, you couldn't feed with two pizzas. The ones on the right, three, four, five. All right, so as we've been going through our rapid experimentation push, there are three lessons I thought that I would share with you. First is to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. There's a concept of scarcity. When you think you only have one idea, you're unwilling to give it up. If you've got many ideas, you're willing to see the evidence that they don't work and move on to the next. For example, with the Fasal team, they quickly learned that the eBay type marketplace wasn't going to work. They quickly learned that their notion of helping farmers to plant more profitable crops wasn't going to work. If they had only had one idea, frankly, they might still be working on it today. Right? Scrappy doesn't mean crappy. <laughs> this is important. Okay. When you first start running rapid experiments, rapid can sometimes imply to some individuals, or quick and dirty, can sometimes imply it really doesn't matter what the quality levels are. Turns out it does. If your customer can't use your product, Right? If the farmers couldn't understand the information that was in front of them about prices and which Mondi agent was paying what, it would have been a useless experiment. It wouldn't have actually tested the hypothesis they were going after. And finally, there is no right answer except for getting started. If you want to do this in your company, you just have to start doing. It's really, really easy to talk. Doing is much more difficult. It's much scarier. You have much more risk of failure. But the reality is, your risk of not starting is much greater. All right, so rapid experiments. Uh, rapid experiments is a very powerful lever that has profound results for us. 